is powerful. Sex can bring people together. Sex can sell hamburgers. Sex can sell cars. Sex can unite countries. Sex creates life. Sex is powerful. It's so powerful, in fact, that we can even sexualize our food. My name is Dr. Celeste Holbrook. I am a sexologist, and my mission in life is to provide safe spaces for women and couples to talk about sex. I have a PhD in health behavior and education. I did postgraduate work in sexual behavior. I taught at two universities teaching healthy sexuality. I worked at a multi-million dollar company as their lead sexual health educator. I've been featured in Huffington Post, in Reader's Digest, in Martha Stewart Weddings. And none of that is as important as the fact that I have struggled with my sex life. And I have felt inadequate. And I have felt sexual shame. And I have felt pain in my sex life. So just like many of you, I have been there too. And I've gone through the journey of figuring out how to overcome some of these things and how to walk through them. And my mom told me when I was young to become the person I needed when I didn't have it. And when I was young, I didn't have somebody to say, it's okay, you're going to be okay. Yes, you feel these things right now, but you can walk through them. And through grace, you can redeem yourself. So I became the person that I needed when I was young and when I had been sexually active and sex was really painful and shameful for me. I became that person. So now I help other people through that process. And the one thing that I realized when I was going through my own process of redefining my sex life and reconstructing a sex life that was full of grace, I realized one thing, and the one thing that keeps many, especially women, from having the most fulfilling sex that super fuels your relationship, and that is comparison. Teddy Roosevelt said, comparison is the thief of joy. And sex, just like other very powerful things, is even more deeply affected by comparison. So today we're going to talk, and I'm going to talk more specifically to women, about the differences in between porn and sex, and how when we compare the two, we feel inadequate. And there are specific reasons for that. We're going to talk about it. And I'm going to give you some suggestions and hope for the future at the end. So hang in there. Let's first talk a little bit about sex in our society. We think we know a lot about sex, right? Because we see it everywhere. We see it in the music that we listen to, in the things that we see on TV, not even pornography, just Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> or Game of Thrones. We see sex a lot represented in our society. But in our own homes, in our own places where we are supposed to foster these spaces, we don't know that much. We have a pretty poor system of sex education in, in, in our society, and so we have this dichotomy of thinking we're totally sexually actualized, and we talk about sex a lot, and we're totally comfortable, but actually what's happening in our own relationships and in our own bedrooms is very different. So we're going to talk about those differences today. What happens when we try to compare what happens on screen with what happens in between the sheets is that we feel like we aren't enough. Because what happens on screen is very unlikely to be what's happening in your bedroom. So before we can have a big conversation about sexual dysfunction, we need to have 
a really realistic conversation about what healthy sexual sexuality is. All right, this is a conversation that's missing in our society and missing as a whole in our community. We need to have better dialogue about what it means to be sexually healthy. We don't really know. Is it frequency? Is it number of orgasms? Is it partners? Is it how you look? Is it how you sound, how you shave? What is it? What is it to mean that you are sexually healthy? So to understand that, we're going to take, I know you're so excited, we're going to take a little trip down psychology lane. If you have ever taken psych, psych 101, this should look fairly familiar to you. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, Abraham Maslow is my psychology boyfriend. I love him. <laughs> God, um, so he has this hierarchy of needs that he developed to help us understand our needs as people. Okay, So this, so far, has nothing to do with sex, but it will in just a minute, so hang in there. Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a way to describe the things we need to live the next moment, the next day, the next month. So at the very bottom, the bottom two rungs are physical things that we need. So our physiological needs are things like what? Air, water, food, tacos. Those are the things that I need to live the next day. Okay. One rung up from that, we have things like safety. So you have clothes on your back. You have a shelter to live in, to sleep in peacefully. You have a community of people that will stand up for you or help you if you are attacked by a bear. Okay, so those are our safety needs. Everything above those bottom two rungs are emotional needs. So one up from safety, we have things like love and belonging. Do I feel like I can give and receive love? Do I feel like I belong in this community? Up from that, we have esteem. Do I feel like I'm good at things? I'm good at sewing, or I'm good at telling a joke, or I'm good at mothering, I'm good at... Um, selling stocks, I'm good at flipping houses, I'm good at having sex, I'm good at um, making macrame. So you feel good at things. And at the top, we have self-actualization. And that's kind of a frou-frou way to say we know ourselves well enough, we know our relationship, and I like to say our relationship with God well enough that we understand that we are responsible for our own choices. Things may happen to us, but we are responsible for how we respond to life. Okay, so that's self-actualization. It's a deep knowing, a deep intimacy. In the Bible, David calls it yada, which is Hebrew for to know, to know oneself, to know God intimately. All right, so those are Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, what I did as a sexologist, I decided I would take my friend Abraham Maslow's theory and I would layer over sexuality because I needed a way to help my clients, to help people in general, talk about sex in a way that made sense and a way that was constructive and that built upon a solid foundation. So I took basically a filter of sexuality and placed it over Abraham, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I created my own theory. And someday you're going to open a sexology textbook and you're going to see this in there. It'll say Dr. Celeste Holbrook. And you'll say, I remember when. <laughs> so you have the sexual hierarchy of needs. So this is a way that we can describe our sex lives in ways that make sense and a way that builds and from survival to thriving. Does that make sense? Okay, so at the very bottom we have physiological sex. So those are all the physiological things one must do in order to engage in sexual behavior. So that's things like positions, that's things like penis and vagina, that's all of the very physical things that we need to have sex. Very physical, nothing more. That's the basics. If you don't know how to do those things, you won't be able to climb the ladder. You won't be able to get higher up in that hierarchy. So second is also physiological things, but they are a little bit more ethereal. Things like safe sex and consensual sex. So um, 
safe sex meaning I know how to protect myself from STIs or STDs. I know how to not get pregnant if I don't want to get pregnant. I know how to um, be in a safe environment when I have sex. And then consensual sex is something that is in the media a lot right now, is enthusiastic, is what I like to say, enthusiastic consent between two people to engage in sexual behavior. Okay? There is where we stop talking about the physical and we rise above to the emotional needs. Now, all of our society tends to have conversations on the bottom two rungs. All of Cosmo Magazine's 10 tips to make his toes squirm, all of everything that you see in the media is typically talking about the very bottom two rungs of our sexual needs. And it is my hope and my, certainly my work, to help us rise above the bottom two so we can experience love and belonging in a relationship. Do you, do you feel like you love the person you are in a sexual relationship with? Do you feel like you belong in that relationship? Is there mutuality there? How about sexual worth? Do you feel worthy of the time and energy and resources it takes to have sex? Do you feel like you're good at sex? Do you feel like you could use some help with sex? Do you feel sexual worth? Really, really important. And then at the very top, sexual actualization. Do I understand that I am in charge of the responses I make when things happen to me sexually? Okay, or if, when I'm engaging sexually? Do I understand the intimacy between myself and my spouse? Do I understand the intimacy between myself and God when it comes to my own sexuality? those two things that we don't want to mix very often. So not only did I want a better way to talk about sex, I also wanted a best practice. Now, if any of you are in education, you might uh, recognize this term, best practice, as something that somebody else may be doing in their classroom, possibly, that has been working really, really well. And so you take their best practice and you implement it in your own classroom. Well, what I wanted to do was take best practices of sexuality in the Bible and apply them to this model. Because I thought, if the Bible is a best practice for life, surely there is an example of a best practice for sex, this thing that we all have in common just as much as eating and sleeping. So I went around looking, and there's some kind of negative things about sex in the Bible, and I didn't want to look there. I wanted to look for the positive. I wanted to look for um, the best practice. So I found it. I found it in Song of Solomon. Which we often think Song of Solomon is a fun, poetic, you know, book that we don't really learn a lot from. But I thought, there has to be something more here. This is beautiful, and this is sensual, and this is erotic. We need to learn something here. All things that put up little, like, you know, alerts in my head. So I looked through Song of Solomon, and I actually found verses that fit in with every single one of these levels. So at the bottom, the lovers are saying, her lips were like scarlet. Her, her uh, neck was like an ivory tower. Her teeth, every one of them had a twin. Which kind of means my girl was so fine, she had all her teeth. <laughs> okay, so there's a lot of descriptions of the very physical parts of sex in Song of Solomon. That was not hard to find. So I thought, okay, let's keep going. Can I find safe and consent? And there's a beautiful verse that says, he put his arm around me like a seal over my heart. He was protecting her. And there's lots of verses about mutuality and consent. So I thought, okay, so let's keep going. What else can we find? Love, belonging. Could I find that in Song of Solomon? And you know that one verse that we all like to inscribe on things? I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. What a beautiful description of belonging. If that is not the most wonderful description of belonging, I don't know what is. I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. So I saw that they had all of these things. They knew how to do the physical. They knew how to do safety. They knew how to do consent. They loved each other. They felt like they belonged. Was there more? Yes. Sexual worth. So at one point she says, I became 
in my lover's eyes like one who brings contentment. That's sexy. Like one who brings contentment. She felt so good about her abilities, about her love, about her sensuality, and her ability to provide that to him, that he, she says she became like one who brings contentment. I love that. She felt sexually worthy, and that's what I want for you. And then sexual actualization. We see this a lot in the words just to know. It's the ultimate intimacy. It's the ultimate give and take of vulnerability. I am raw and open and honest in my vulnerability with you, and you are raw and open and honest in vulnerability with me. We are literally naked together, sharing bits of each other that we don't share with anybody else. That is sexual actualization. So I found it. I figured out how to describe sex in a, in a healthy way so we could figure out how to climb up this ladder. And so I could figure out when clients were struggling or when I was struggling where the hang-up was. For example, and we won't spend a lot of time on this, but for example, if your first sexual experience is non-consensual, it is very difficult for you to feel love and belonging later on. <clears throat> so, let's bring this all back to pornography. Pornography. Porn doesn't even make it onto the pyramid. <laughs> it doesn't even make it. So, if we are watching porn, or if our partner is watching porn, this, uh, this keeps us from moving up the pyramid because it doesn't even begin at the bottom. It's something totally different. But until we understand that and detach from it, we will constantly compare ourselves with pornography. So, my, um, <laughs> my own therapist says, uh, Celeste, you need to check your thoughts because your thoughts are not always reliable, which was very enlightening for me that my thoughts, as an educated person, could not always be reliable. And that's what happens a lot with sex. When we don't have the right information to compare to, we often have unreliable thoughts, like, I need to look like she looks, or I need to have her bra size, or I need to do what she's doing, or I need to shave like her, or I need to be smaller or bigger or something other than I am to be worthy of good sex. And those are not reliable thoughts because they are based on the assumption that porn and sex are equatable, and they're not. You can't even compare them. Comparing porn and sex is like comparing apples and stingrays. Not even on the same level. Okay, so that's how we're going to steal our joy back, is to provide better, more reliable thought about what sex is and about what porn is. And that's the journey you're going to go on with me today. So first of all, sex is a learned behavior, okay? We like to think that sex is natural, and it is. It's something that was created for us and for us to do. But sex is no more natural than eating healthy. You have to learn to eat healthy. You have to learn to take care of your body. You have to learn how to be in a relationship, and you have to learn how to drive. You have to learn how to have healthy sex. It's a learned behavior. Porn is entertainment. It's not education. So when we are learning how to have sex, but learning how to have sex from something that is intended to entertain, we are learning essentially the wrong things. For example, Let's pretend that nobody had driver's ed. Let's pretend that we all learned how to drive by watching the Fast and the Furious series. Let's pretend like that we never ever got in a car until we were 16, and the only thing that was ever shown us about cars is the Fast and the Furious. And so I get into a car, and I think that I can drive off cliffs, and I think that I don't have to apply any rules to the stop signs or the stoplights, or none of that applies to me, and I think I'm just going to be totally fine if I have a wreck. Right? That doesn't happen 
because from the day you're brought home from the hospital, you are witnessing modeled good driving behavior, I hope. <laughs> okay? That doesn't happen because you have good education about driving. Unfortunately, we don't have good education about sex. So we get this education where we can, and because it's so easily available, we get our education from something that is only intended to entertain, among other things. It is not intended as an education. So sex is a learned behavior. I had clients come in recently, and they were newly married, and uh, they were about six months into their marriage, and the husband had you know, kind of dabbled in porn for a while. Not an addictive thing. Most people aren't addicted to porn. Most people just dabble in porn here and there, right? Um, but had grown up kind of watching porn from the time he was about 12, and now he was in his 20s, now newly married, to a wife who had, had waited until she was married to have intercourse. Um, and they, were, they just had such varied expectations about what was supposed to happen in their bedroom that he was incredibly frustrated that she wouldn't have anal sex with him, and she was incredibly frustrated because she could barely have the courage to take her clothes off right? So that's what happens when we are uh, educated by something that should be or is intended for entertainment, not education at all. Neither of them had had a whole lot of sexual partners, but one was educated by porn. Sex defines your relationship. My best friend is named Alicia. Alicia and I are really close. We talk a lot about things. We're very, we would say, I would say we were very intimate. Um, we grew up together, we met when we were four, fast friends, best friends. Now, however many years later, we are still best friends, right? Alicia and I are very intimate, we're very close. But my relationship with my husband is the one where we have sex. It literally defines my relationship versus my other relationships where I am intimate and close. Yes, I share more things with my husband conversationally than I do with any of my other friends, but the sex is what literally defines our relationship. Okay, I have sex with my husband. I don't have sex with any of my other friends. Porn is not a, def a definition of a relationship. Porn is a coping mechanism. And Bernie kind of talked about this earlier, about how porn is a way to feel momentarily better. And I emphasize momentarily. Just like any other kind of thing that you might use, a coping mechanism to feel better, there are healthy coping mechanisms um, that not only make you feel better in the short term, but the long term, like going for a run. And there are unhealthy coping mechanisms. When I feel stressed, I watch porn. It's an unhealthy coping mechanism that maybe help me feel better in the moment, but in the long run, is destructive maybe to myself and to my relationship. So porn is a coping mechanism. Sex defines, and porn is simply a cope. Okay, sex is a type of intimacy. If we said intimacy is an umbrella, sex would be underneath that umbrella of intimacy. You can be intimate in a lot of different ways, and you're intimate, like we said earlier, with your friends, um, with your family, but sex is that type of intimacy that is specific to a, a partnered relationship. The key cornerstone to intimacy and the thing that's at the top of the sexual hierarchy of needs is vulnerability. Vulnerability, one of my favorite things to talk about. You must have vulnerability in order to have intimacy. And there's nothing more vulnerable than literally being naked with somebody. And you're putting parts in other parts that you wouldn't allow with anybody else, right? It's incredibly vulnerable. You must feel safe. You must feel secure. You must feel trusted in that moment. Porn, however, is, it does not require any vulnerability on the user's part. So I can see images, get what I need, have an orgasm, feel better momentarily, and I gave nothing to the people on the screen. Nothing. 
you are more intimate with your barista than you are with anybody on screen, because at least your barista knows your name and your favorite drink. <laughs> okay, so intimacy uh, is, a sexuality is a form of intimacy, and porn is not. Let's talk a little bit about spontaneous and responsive arousal. This is another one of my favorite topics. <laughs> So let's, if you hear nothing else from this presentation, I want you to hear this, because this can really change the way you think about sex, especially as a female. There are two main types of arousal, spontaneous and responsive. Most of the world looks at sex in terms of spontaneity, which means I feel aroused, so I seek out sexual behavior feel aroused, so I'll go try and get sex. I feel aroused, so I'll try and uh, initiate, right? Not a bad thing, but that's one type of arousal. The second type of arousal is responsive arousal. So we operate kind of on a continuum between these two types of arousals, but about half the population operates on responsive arousal, about half the population operates on spontaneous arousal, and it's not separated by gender, per se, and we kind of flip-flop as we go throughout life. But just know that responsive arousal is where I start sexual behavior before I feel aroused. And that's just as worthy of a type of arousal as spontaneous arousal, but it's not championed in, the, in what we see in media. What we see in media is the heady, throw up against the wall, you know, swinging from the chandeliers type of spontaneous stuff, right? When really, many, many people experience responsive arousal, meaning I have to engage in some type of sexual activity and then the, the arousal will come, okay? Um, the difference is porn doesn't even get on this scale at all. Porn is purposeful visual arousal. Purposeful visual arousal. And we're going to talk about visual in just a minute. But um, <clears throat> when we think about when we think about arousal and how porn is one of those things that doesn't even require any work, any type of sexual behavior prior, or anything like that, we think something is wrong when we aren't visually arousing, okay? Let's talk about that a little bit more. Mutuality. Mutuality is something that we don't necessarily talk about, but it's really important in any sexual encounter. Mutuality is a give and take of anything in a sexual experience, right? Sex is mutual. It means two people are enthusiastically consensual, and two people know how to give and take a beautiful compromise to help feel pleasure and connection. There's a, there's a great study out there, um, and it looked at people all over the world, generalizable to, very, to a lot of different cultures, a lot of different types of people, and they asked, what is it that most people want out of their sex life? And, it, and the, the responses indicated that most people want out of their sex life some combination of pleasure and connection. Pleasure and connection. It wasn't most people want out of their sex life an orgasm. It wasn't some people, you know, what, what people want out of their sex life is a lot of sex. No. Pleasure and connection. That's what we really want out of our sex lives. So sex emphasizes mutuality, and porn emphasizes the male gaze. So I'm, tr I'm going to give you... I'm going to try and discuss in a short amount of time about a semester's worth of the history of sexuality. <laughs> Just real quickly. Um, so a little over 90, and it's dropping a little bit, but a little over 90% of porn is produced by and marketed to men. Now, what does that mean for women? That means that the porn that is watched is showing visuals of only things that represent male desire. 
So things that are largely not included in porn are things like female pleasure, the clitoris, appropriate lubricant, <laughs> okay? Just a small representation of things that aren't, aren't talked about or aren't shown in pornography. And if we are learning how to be sexual through this, what we would call a male gaze, there's a whole other part of our sexuality, especially as women, that's being left out. So if we think that porn is sex, and that's how I should be, be in my bedroom, we are probably thinking, I don't look like her, I don't have her bra size, our, the porn industry even dictates how we shave, <laughs> how we sound. Have you ever thought about this? Before there was talkies, or like movies that you heard, we didn't really have an idea of what other people sounded like during sex. Have you ever thought about that? Unless you heard your parents have sex, because before the kind of the 18th century, we grew up in kind of small one-room homes where hearing your parents have sex was fairly normal. Unless you heard people have sex, you really didn't know how sex sounded. But now we have all these expectations because we watch sex on TV or our partner watches sex on TV. Now we have all these expectations of how we should sound, what we should look like, what we should do, the things we should do, and with whom, and how many. <laughs> and we're not developing our own sexual identity. We're basically being told through a male lens how to express female sexuality. So I hear a lot, men are more visual. Well, I would agree that men are different, differently visual, but there's significant data, and now we have more funding for sexual health research about female sexual pleasure. There's some really interesting data that suggests men and women are just differently visual. I mean, have you ever wondered why women watch so much HGTV? It's not because that they're not visual. <laughs> or why we take so many pictures of our food, <laughs> or why, for example, there's a line around the block to see Fifty Shades of Grey, and they're all women. It's not that women aren't visual. We are visual. We match our underwear and our bras. <laughs> we are differently visual. So maybe a picture of an erect penis isn't what does, isn't what does it for a woman but maybe a look on a ripple of a back of our husband chopping wood or our husband telling a joke or playing with kids. Maybe that is what's visually stimulating for us. Okay, so we aren't differently visual. I mean, we aren't not visual. We are differently visual. But when you think about porn and how over 90% is produced by and marketed to men, we feel like we aren't visual, okay? So just, uh, just something to think about when we think about how we consume sexuality and how sexuality has been presented over the years. It's been presented by the people in power, and the people in power were male. Okay, sex is fueled by intention. You guys, sex is hard work. <laughs> Healthy sex, good sex, pleasurable and connective sex is hard work. It has to be intentional. It's not going to happen naturally. It may at the beginning, and you may think it's more natural. People come into my office all the time and say, Celeste, I want sex to be spontaneous like it was when we were first married. And I say, okay, but if you really think about it, sex was never spontaneous, right? Because when you were first engaged in sexual activity, you thought about it a lot. If it were truly spontaneous, if sex were truly spontaneous, you'd be walking down the sidewalk and all of a sudden you're having sex. <laughs> and that's not the kind of sex that anybody really wants to have. <laughs> so sex is not spontaneous, it is intentional. So in the beginning of a relationship, it's on the brain, it's on the mind, you know, oh, we're gonna be together Thursday, I think it's gonna happen then. You anticipate. So sex is intentional, it has to be intentional, and that is what you have to work on as we age and grow and we have more responsibilities. Did you know that the biggest killer of arousal is responsibility? And that's why sex can make babies, but babies can mean the end of sex. Because nothing feels more responsible than keeping that thing alive 
Or in my instance, because I had twin, keeping both of those things alive. <laughs> so sex is fueled by intention. Porn is fueled by novelty. Novelty. Okay, so we talked about this earlier. Several of the other presenters talked about how um, porn is something that once you consume, you need bigger, better, more, whatever, different, to get the same response. So porn is fueled by novelty, and when you can get that novelty downloaded as quickly as you can snap your fingers, it's so much easier to get aroused than having to work at your own sex life. Okay, so porn is fueled by novelty. It makes it easy to consume because you can get anything you want, and that's how you have the... the the Jared Fogles of the world, uh, the subway guy who at age however, you know, 9, 10, accessed some softcore porn, but by the age of 30, whatever, he is going to jail for child pedophilia, for having child pornography on his computer. Okay, so that's the novelty, that's the arc of novelty that porn takes you in. Now that's an extreme example and most people don't go down that road, but when it's so easy to get that same high, through the access of pornography on the internet, it's easy to choose that over the work that it takes to have pleasure and connection in your own sex life. I like to say that everything that happens in between your sexual experiences is foreplay. Everything. That snarky comment is gonna lead you away from good sex. That offer to help out, what can I do to help you, will lead you to better sex, more healthy, more connective sex. So everything, every interaction that you have between sexual experiences is foreplay. It leads you to or away from a positive sexual experience. So sex is fueled by intention. What are your intentions? Be intentional about your sex life and you will have that pleasure, that connection that you seek. So when we face the reality of healthy sex and we realize what se healthy sex is and what porn is, that apple to stingray, we can lovingly release the need to compare ourselves. We no longer have to feel like we are not good enough. So let's take the joy of sex back from porn by giving, by giving ourselves permission to be enough, just as we are, to have healthy, wonderful, uh, sex that super fuels your relationship. Right now, just as we are, as women, in the body that you own, in the, the ways that you show love, you are worthy. You are worthy. So you don't have to change size. You don't have to change shape. You don't have to change the way that you shave. You don't have to change the way that you sound. You don't have to change the way that you look, you don't have to change the things that you do, you don't have to change your age, even if you could, <laughs> you don't have to change how you think or how you feel about your body in order to be enough and worthy of healthy sexuality, to be enough and worthy of sexuality that super fuels your relationship. Okay? We no longer have to compare. We can release the need to compare ourselves, our bodies, our sex life with something that doesn't even remotely get on to the scale. So as you're working through the sexual hierarchy of needs, figuring out how this works, how to achieve you know, sex that's both pleasurable and connective, sex that leads me toward sexual actualization, toward the knowing, toward God, toward grace, toward a sex that super fuels your relationship. Know from the depths of your being, you are created enough. You are enough just as you are. Right now, in this moment, you are enough to experience the things that you want to experience. Thank you.